Hi everyone, my name is Njenga Hakina. I am the Africa Climate Editor at the China Global South Project. Just before we get to today's podcast, I want to update you on the work we are doing at CGSP. While there is extensive news coverage on China's relations with the United States, Europe and the current situation involving Taiwan, the same cannot be said for its interactions with developing countries, also referred to as the Global South. Unfortunately, there is a lack of comprehensive reporting in this area. And this is precisely where our team comes in. We have a dedicated group of editors who are in Africa, Asia, the Middle East, and who diligently report on these stories in real time every day. Furthermore, we make it a point to provide our content in three languages. We have it in English, in French, and in Arabic. If you'd like to join our growing community of readers from around the world, go to China Global South forward slash subscribe. And subscriptions start at just $19 a month. Once again, that's ChinaGlobalSouth.com forward slash subscribe. Thank you. The China in Africa podcast is brought to you in partnership with the Africa China Reporting Project at Wits University in Johannesburg. The ACRP promotes balanced, considered reporting on China-Africa relations through training programs held throughout the year. More information at africachinareporting.com. Hello and welcome to another edition of the China in Africa podcast. I'm Eric Olander, and as always, I'm joined by China Global South's managing editor, Kobus van Staden, and our Africa editor, Jero Nima from Mauritius. A very good, happy new year to both of you. Welcome to 2024. Happy new year. Happy new year, and 2024 is here. It's here, and uh, Kobus, I think every time we start the new year, I always have to remind everybody how long that we've been doing this show, we are now entering our 15th year of this program, if you can believe it. I mean, it's just incredible. So 15 years of covering China, Africa on this podcast, going all the way back to early 2010. You know, it was in that vein that I was thinking about what you were writing today in our newsletter about your year in preview, how 2024 will set the tone for the next phase of the Africa-China relationship. And that's going to be the theme of our program today, where we're going to do what we do every year in January, a year in preview show. So our last program from December, and this is the custom we've done over the past 15 years, is we look back on the year in December, and then the first program of January, we look forward at what to expect in China-Africa relations. Kobus, you outlined some key themes. Let me just quote a key line, and then I want you to kind of expand on this. You said, I've argued that the relationship is failing on the deepest level, where engagement with China fundamentally transforms the continent's global position. Can you expand on that? Well, I think the hope that was felt among many Africans when the China-Africa relationship really took off was that in some way China will offer Africa different options, different you know, kind of like methods of working together, something different that will change Africa's position, you know, kind of in in the global scene. And I think we need to keep in mind that that position was fundamentally, you know, created through the relationship between Africa and the West. And and obviously, obviously colonialism and, and, you know, so on is like formed a big part of that. But that doesn't necessarily mean, I don't necessarily mean that everything in that relationship is bad. I What I m- mean more is that it depends a lot on agendas and thinking and you know ideas of the world in western capitals and among western corporate leaders it's like what do they want to do with africa what is possible for them and within that there's been very interesting developments you know kind of we've seen the eu and us for example move much more conclusively towards infrastructure provision over the last two years or so. So there's action in that space, but it doesn't particularly change Africa's position fundamentally You know, in relation to how it deals with the world. It still is dealing with the world in very similar ways than before, and it's dealing with China in similar ways as it is dealing with, the, with other parts of the world. So, you know, so in that sense, China has so far not really, really transformed Africa's position in the world, but let's see what happens. So, Giro, picking up on what Kobus was saying and reflecting back on the history of China-Africa relations, you've been looking at this story for the past 10 years. You've spent a lot of time in China. You obviously have a lot of experience in the DR Congo, now Mauritius and elsewhere. 
give us your reflection the same way that Cobus was was looking back on this and then use that as a jumping off point for our conversation today about what to expect in 2024. Yes, from what Kobe said is really right that fundamentally nothing really changed in terms of Africa's position in the way it relates to the great powers to China, to Europe and to the West. And I do believe it's not fundamentally, we cannot blame China on that. And I think it's much more because African countries and Africa itself. Because when you look at the past years, how we relate to China, we engage China in a way that we didn't want to perform the change that was coming from the West in terms of structural change, adjustment and anything, we saw China as the option to make the West jealous. So fundamentally, as long as we could get that from China, China and funded many things, infrastructure and anything, but on our side, we did not make the changes to put ourselves from the simple, you know, bystander of the international system to become real players and real actors. Because fundamentally we did not have an agenda. We did not say that, you know, China is coming to the international system, is becoming a new player. How are we going for us as African, as an African continent, as an African country, how are we going to use China to leapfrog ourselves on the global stage to become real actor? We kept on using China as this disgruntled wife who find an affair outside to make the husband jealous. And that's when China decided to change, we felt it again. We felt it when China now moved from the big infrastructure investment to small and beautiful. We felt it when China is now complaining about the level of debt of many African countries. We start feeling it now. And this is really when I'm looking in 2024, I'm kind of wondering where we are going as African, as African country. Now that, for instance, the BRIC has enlarged, we are three African countries into the BRICS, and now China has, has moved to, to small, beautiful. How are we going to adjust in that new environment? How are we going to still be able to get to reconcile our need for investment for infrastructure to that China 2.0 in Africa. How are we going to deal with that? Because for sure China has its own agenda, but I'm not sure that Africa has a comprehensive clear agenda on how it's going now to move with China now that China has changed its approach in Africa. This for me is a big question and it's really much of a worry for me than anything else. Well, those are good setups for our discussion today. And for regular listeners of the show, you'll know that this first program of the year is less about us and what we think and more about what we survey scholars and analysts around the world. So what we've done for this program is I sent out maybe about 20, 25 invitations for different scholars and folks give us their forecasts and their previews of what to expect in the year ahead for China-Africa relations. We got back six amazing responses from scholars in Europe, Asia, Africa, and the U.S., And so what we're going to do is we're going to kind of run through what they think is the key issues, trends, and stories to watch for the year ahead, and then we'll get Cobus and Giro's uh, feedback from this. Both of you have talked about the importance of vision and strategy, and 2024 is going to be a critical year for that because it is the year of FOCAC, that is the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation. This is an event that happens every three years. And Torella Moses, who's a data analyst and database manager at the Global China Initiative at the Boston University Global Development Policy Center, she had some reflections on FOCAC. Uh, And this is really important because Torella and the team at BU did some absolutely groundbreaking analysis last year on Chinese debt, Chinese development finance, and Belt and Road lending. So a lot of the issues, Jero, that you brought up in terms of small is beautiful, that came out of data and research by the BU team. And this was especially important in the energy and infrastructure sectors. So let's take a listen to what Torella's forecast was, particularly as it relates to FOCAC. 2024 is an important year for China-Africa relations because of three factors. First, it is the first full year of the post-pandemic era. Second, it is the year of the 2024 Forum on China-Africa Cooperation, or FOCAC. And third, it is the FOCAC that follows the third Belt and Road Initiative Summit, which laid out a blueprint for China's engagement with the Global South for the upcoming years. This blueprint really emphasized a desire to produce a leaner, greener, and smarter BRI. So in 2024, we will likely see an application of these major milestones and um, some of these goals for the future of the Belt and Road Initiative to the China-Africa relationship. 
In terms of lending and debt, we'll likely see China emphasize its smarter and leaner approach to supporting new projects um, with an emphasis on financial feasibility. While there will be an uptick in lending commitments compared to previous years to show continued interests and deliverables, we'll likely see more talk of trade and Chinese companies at the forefront, especially when it comes to investing in projects. You know, high-profile debt cases involving Angola and Zambia and others have shaped how China will approach relations with African countries because China has had to work out how to go about addressing non-repayment in such a public way. So there have been many lessons learned, I think, on the Chinese creditor side. And I'm hoping that in 2024, we see more of a cohesion as well as more of an apparent set of goals when it comes to addressing non-repayment at the 2024 FOCAC. I think these lessons will lead to more of an emphasis on a high-quality cooperation between China and, and African countries. So in short, there will be a lot of fanfare, uh, strong rhetoric, and pleasantries, especially due to it being a FOCAC year from both the Chinese side and the African country side. And for us as observers, it's going to be important to listen and read between the lines um, and distinguish between grandiose commitments and expected execution. It's also going to be important for us to listen to the demands of both the Chinese and African countries' side because those demands will likely shape the future of the relationship. Kobus, let's pick the conversation up there in terms of the demands. This is a topic that you and I have talked about a lot. What do you think the demands that Torella talks about are going to be both from the Chinese side and the African side leading up to the FOCAT conference later this year? I think there's a tendency both on the Chinese side and on the African side to try and kind of cast the FOCAC net as wide as possible. And we've seen this over years. There's not only already wide kind of like range of things that are covered, including people to people exchange, you know, kind of cultural exchange, media exchange, all of all of these different things. But then also the kind of net is made wider and wider, you know, as time goes on. So there's this kind of like a commitment creep, I think, that that happens. And so I agree that demand is going to shape the relationship. What, what, what I, I think, would be interested in seeing, particularly on the African side, around the hierarchies of demands, particularly considering that, that what we know that you know, China doesn't have as much money as they used to have, and that China wants bang for the buck. So in that case, is media exchange so important? Question mark. You know, you know, like what 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 I would be looking out for is is whether Africa has the ability to say these demands are particularly important. And you know, kind of, and, and to my mind, cooperation on energy, for example, particularly renewables, that China has a lot of like excess capacity for would be an example of something where there's high priority on the Chinese side, on the African side, and it makes sense to prioritize that demand over maybe some other demands. But, you know, kind of that I think is, you know, is, is, is maybe not 100% taking Torella's kind of comments, you know, as, as, as she kind of positioned them. But, you know, that that is one of the things that came to my mind as I was listening to her. Well, you might be looking at the is media important question mark, rhetorical slash cynical way of looking at that from a purely <laughs> African point of view. And because from the Chinese point of view, I think those media narratives are very important. And Africa is very important oh, yeah. to the Chinese. From the Chinese side, very important. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. In terms of building this coalition, ideological coalition that is anti-Western or that is more aligned with China's worldview. So again, this is the competing demands, I think, that Torella was talking about. Giro Torella also brought up this question of trade and investment. That's something that we've been looking at. Now, the Chinese at the last FOCAC said that they were going to buy, or you remember this, $300 billion worth of African exports. They have come nowhere close to buying $300 billion worth of African exports. That was a ridiculous promise to begin with. That being said, it's aspirational, great, but there is a lot of investment that is starting to come in, particularly in the mining sector, which is an area that you follow. The The huge Samandu mine in Guinea is getting underway. Billions are still being plowed into the Democratic Republic of the Congo. 
pick up the conversation from what Torella was talking about in terms of trade and investment, and where do you see that going this year? Oh, yeah. In terms of trade and investment, we should see a lot of more action happening there. In terms of investment, yes, mining will remain the focal point of Chinese investment in, uh, in Africa. We see, you mentioned the uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, where Chinese company, China Muli Bedam Simok, is going to invest much more into its TFM project. Now that it's launched its new cobalt project, Kinsan for Mine, so we're going to expect much more financing coming in that space as well. In terms of agriculture as well, we see that China, last year during the FOCAC, China has signed an agreement with South Africa to, import, to have import of avocado or fresh avocado from South Africa to China. And Tanzania also is now following the same path. We, and we know that China has been trying to move in that space of agriculture imports from Africa to try to fill the gap in this trade uh, imbalance with Africa, but still a long way to go. So the question will be how much Africa is going to take the opportunity of that, that China is opening up its markets to import product, to export their product to China. Last year, the, at the end of the last year, China has kind of canceled many tax for many African countries import to China. China. So I think we are almost to what 20 something African countries that cannot import um, their product to China. But the problem is how much they can really import except for raw materials. We also see in terms of investment where China is pushing into new oil projects in Niger, in Benin, in Uganda as well. We also see something happening, as you mentioned, Simandu, where we hope Beijing is going to give his green light to China Alcoen, but we still to launch investment. The, the Rio Tinto has been waiting in Simandu. But there is also something that Terrell has mentioned, I think we should be paying attention to that. She mentioned the fact that there will be much more scrutiny on the visibility and the vi financial viability of many projects. And we see that, for instance, now that China is negotiating the refurbishment and the concession contract for the Tazara Railway, the Tanzania and Zambia Railway that connects the port of Dar es Salaam to Zambia. We see how much there is a very thorough process happening. There is a tripartite like uh, working uh, group as put in place between Zambia, Tanzania, and China. We see different approach, the really a very long process that are taking place before China green lighting the financing of that project. We are talking about billions of projects here. But even there, we are going to a PPP, public partnership, where China is going to be involved. We see that China is also changing its approach of even on those on those big investments. It's now putting its place of like they want to make sure that it's economically viable, that it, you know, it makes sense, they're going to take time before deciding into financing a new project. So I think we're going to see a lot of those happening as well, where we're going to see much more China being more thorough, being, being more careful on where and how much is putting his money on different infrastructure projects on the continent. And one area to keep an eye out for is in the electric vehicle battery metal space, something that Giro and I follow very closely. That's going to be a lot of investment probably coming from China. We just saw in December a $250 million lithium processing deal in Nigeria. Zimbabwe is well advanced in this in terms of the Chinese processing lithium as well. And Morocco is emerging as a major hub for this. And uh, Giro, December came and went. And that passed the one-year anniversary of the U.S. DRC Zambia deal to do battery metal processing. I know the Americans say they've been trying hard, but at the end of the day, if you are in a competition with the Chinese on this, which the Americans say they are, you look at the results on the ground, and the Chinese seem to be making considerably more progress than the Americans do in this front. Let's stay with the economy for our next forecast, and we're going to go to our, our friend in Singapore, Amit Jain, who's the director of the NTU SBF Center for African Studies at the Nanyang Business School, which is Southeast Asia's only area study think tank on Africa. And it has a particular focus on business. Amit's an old friend of the show, and he's been with us on the program last year, and he's just really a fantastic perspective. And he really brings a truly Asia-Africa view to a lot of issues. He thinks it's going to be a very tough year ahead for many African countries and doesn't believe that either China or India are going to step up their economic engagement on the continent to make the transformational changes that Kobus talked about. Let's take a listen to what Amit Jain has to say for what's ahead for 2024. Uh, the average growth forecast for Africa this year is no more than 4% uh, per annum. For a continent whose population is itself growing at almost 3% every year, uh, that is certainly not good news. It means fewer jobs, less revenues, and even less money in the pockets of ordinary Africans, 
whose incomes have been eroded by inflation and currency depreciation. Foreign investors uh, appear to be scaling back and raising finance has become much harder. Africa will face multiple challenges as it looks to 2024. But addressing debt, in my opinion, remains the top issue. I would be keeping a close watch on how African governments renegotiate debt service obligation, keep their currency stable, control inflation, and attract investors in an environment where interest rates remain stubbornly high. Would Asia step in to fill that financing void? I doubt it. Although both China and India are set to host their respective Africa-focused summits this year, it is unlikely there would be spectacular breakthroughs. The macroeconomic environment is not going to be very benign for Africa this year. Kobus, you've been writing about this just this week, in fact, about the situation in Kenya where the debt servicing costs for the Chinese financed and built standard gauge railway have gone up because of the depreciation of the Kenya shilling. This is playing out across the continent. And in again, a more sobering view from Singapore and Amit Jain. Yes, I tend to agree with him. You know, you were referring to in, in, in Kenya, it, it turns out that they had to, they were paying, I think, about $87 million more this January than they were in, in repaying the, the loan for the Standard Gauge Railway to China than they were paying last January. And that's because of currency depreciation and, you know, partly also because of, of high interest rates in the U.S., and so, you know, so it was interesting when there were rumors that, that the Fed in the U.S. might relax interest rates, that also the, the markets in South Africa responded immediately to that. And, you know, I think that's just true across the, the, the whole global south. I think this is still a very constrained kind of post-COVID moment for Africa. And, you know, the, all of the problems around debt, debt, debt restructuring, then raises a lot of, of, of questions about how the global south is going to be engaging with you know with finances in, in you know in the, over the next few years, um, particularly as they as they're facing this kind of double whammy of of both developmental issues needing to kind of get ahead of population growth, as you mentioned, as well as climate and you know kind of other related impacts so it's, it's, it's a lot of big questions i think you know kind of not only related to china but but it relatedly also to how western private capital for example is going to be operating in the global south Giro, uh, amit talked about how he did not think that chinese or indian capital is going to come to the rescue in africa i think this speaks again to the same question you've been bringing up that African stakeholders, whether on the corporate side or in government, need to have more refined strategies in order to engage Asian investors and Asian stakeholders, given that there's a lot of competition for those dollars. Exactly. I think we're not taking Asia seriously in Africa. I might be shocking many, but... And that's beyond... Just... Asia here is beyond China. This is Southeast Asia, India, Indonesia. Exactly. We are not taking Asia seriously. I think we are still somehow European, Western-centric and uh, World Bank and IMF centering that we kind of approach Asia only and when we feel that we cannot get what we want from European and Western countries. We don't engage Asian countries for who they are and what they can really offer in the way that how us Africa can align our agenda, how can we organize our approach in a way that we make ourselves appealing to Indian investment or to Chinese investment or to South Korea or Japan investment. We are not doing that except for a few countries. You take Morocco, Egypt, Tunisia on the top and you have South Africa on the bottom. But just in right there in the middle, we are kind of in a limbo where nobody's really thinking strategy on how to engage each region of the world the way they are. Today we are talking about Asia, but we also have the same issue with Latin America, with Brazil, for instance. We've been talking about Brazil a lot, but we have done nothing much in terms of making ourselves appealing to those dollars. And I think it speaks to the way us as Africans, we are governing our country, the rational behind. And I think we need to do much better than that. Otherwise, we're going to keep on complaining. We're going to be, so we're going to be streamrolled by any great power rivalry that's going to happen. And we're just going to be by standard of how the international system is going to work. Well, let's move from economics to politics. This is going to be a year of elections around the world. There are going to be a lot of elections in Africa this year. There was just one 
in your neighborhood, uh, Giraud, in the DRC <laughs> uh, last month. And uh, just for those of you who are not paying attention to Congolese politics, uh, Felix Chesikedi, the incumbent, won again with something like 70 or 80 percent of the vote. I mean, a huge number. Not everybody is confident that that was a legitimate vote, yes, but exactly. uh, you know, here here we are. Welcome to elections in the Congo. This seems to be par for the course. And another one is coming to your neighborhood, Hobus, in South Africa this year, among many others. This is also the case around the world, as there are going to be a lot of elections, particularly in the global south, and in my country, in the United States, is going to be a huge election, and that's going to be very consequential yeah. for the world especially if Donald Trump does return to power. Let's get a perspective now from our good friend Lucas Fiala, who is the head of China Foresight at LSE Ideas, which is the London School of Economics' foreign policy think tank. And he's a regular columnist for us, the China Global South Project, where you can find his insightful comments and analysis every Friday in our newsletter that's also available on our site over the weekends. And that's available, by the way, without subscription. So I really recommend that you take a look on our site for Lucas's columns because they are absolutely fascinating. And he is convinced that elections are going to be a very important trend to watch in Africa and around the world. And it's going to challenge how China engages many of these countries that are going to change in terms of political power. My top three for the year 2024 are the following. First, uh, the effects of democratic elections. This year, we'll see an unprecedented number of popular elections across uh, the world. The interesting point here, of course, is that the Communist Party of China is often seen to be unencumbered by democratic pressures domestically and consequently is able to strategize far into the future. But while China's leadership in Beijing is not necessarily affected by democratic pressures domestically, it will have to adapt in some way, shape or form to the changing governments in other countries. And key examples here, of course, uh, include the Taiwanese election on January 13th that is coming up and may affect cross-trade cross relations as well as uh, the broader US-China relationship but apart from Taiwan, important middle powers such as Mexico and South Africa will go to the polls. And China has strategic interests in these countries and will certainly be watching the results of uh, these various elections very closely. Second, China's crisis diplomacy, particularly during a period of instability and war. Since ending uh, China's strict COVID measures, uh, Xi Jinping and his top diplomats in Beijing have uh, really worked over time to uh, protect China's image as a responsible major power, uh, a major power that is interested in playing a more active role in resolving overseas crises. And I think in this context, we should pay close attention to how China is maneuvering vis-a-vis -vis the wars in Ukraine and Gaza, but also vis-a-vis -vis particular regional peace processes, such as the ongoing one in Ethiopia. And last but not least, I think we should pay close attention to the future of Sinocentric diplomatic initiatives, and two I think are particularly important. The first is BRICS. China has over the last year pushed for BRICS enlargement, but this has so far yielded mixed results. Saudi Arabia has confirmed membership in the first week of this year, but Argentine President Millet, who was recently elected, um, and again kind of shows this importance of democratic processes and their effects on China has uh, withdrawn from the bloc. So I think it remains to be seen how Beijing will navigate these new dynamics. Secondly, of course, uh, the Foreign China Africa Corporation, which uh, will be coming up in the latter half of this year, will be a very, very important indicator for China Africa relations into the future. I expect uh, important issues, of course, including the omnipresent debt problem, uh, post pandemic economic growth, and emerging issues such as tech and security cooperation to be on the agenda. But I think also that one of the common mistakes that we make is that we see FOCAC solely through the lens of Africa-China relations, when in fact FOCAC also provides us with a much broader indicator of where Beijing wants to direct China's overarching global strategy and engagement. And I think with new data on China's financing along the Belt and Road and elsewhere emerging recently, I would keep a close eye on Beijing's financial commitments at the summit for signposts of China's evolving grand strategy as we're heading gradually deeper into Xi Jinping's third term. Kobus Lucas does not disappoint in his ability to cover large, large swaths of territory in his assessments there. It's going to be a turbulent year for China around the world, obviously for everybody, given the wars in the Mideast, Russia, 
and the upcoming summits. And it's interesting that he talked about those Sinocentric initiatives at the BRICS, the you know Belt and Road, and then FOCAC. Let's get your take on what Lucas had to say. Very, very interesting points. I think in relation to these Sinocentric initiatives, I think this is really is a year where China is going to want to demonstrate that it is kind of a big fixture in, on the world landscape, that these initiatives like the Belt and Road Initiative are not just rhetoric. And, and the fact that all of that is happening in a moment of a lot of instability, kind of political instability around the world is interesting because you know, China tends to favor stability over instability. So it'll be interesting to see how they do that. I'll also, you know, I think I think all of us will be will be looking very hard at the financial commitments and I think they'll be very revealing no matter what happens. What I expect is for them to be a lot more diffuse, similar to like particularly in, in, in the way that they're announced or that they, they that they that they're packaged. You know, like what we already saw in the previous FOCAC is the stepping away from a single big number. And I, I expect more of that, you know, probably from from FOCAC this year. But it's going to be very interesting to see how China navigates all of these different elections, particularly in places like South Africa, where they had they have a, a you know a multi-year relationship with an incumbent government who is now, even though you know some people expect them to maintain their position, the current party in South Africa is very embattled. So it's going to be very interesting to see, you know, how China navigates these changes, you know, because it's it's something that China is actually not very adept at navigating frequently. Well, yes and no. I mean, a lot of people... Well, actually, yes, as you say, yes and no. Yeah, I mean, it's a mixed record, but, uh, you know, people said that, you know, they were so close to Robert Mugabe in Zimbabwe, and they said when Mugabe goes, they're in real trouble. And sure enough, when Emerson Menengagwa showed up on the scene, his first trip was to Beijing. They, but they I mean, did. it's still a ZANU presidency, right? Kind of, so it's not like they were the, like, like that, that's the thing. If, if the ANC loses in South Africa, that is like, it's like the Catholic Church having to be removed from Italian society, right? Kind of like, it's like, how do you do it without changing the entire country? And that, I think that kind of those changes, I think, are, are, are big challenges for China. When the Patriotic Front in Zambia lost and Hishilema came into power, a new party, very break with the past of Edgar Lungu. The Chinese adapted very well. Same in Nigeria as well, where there's a change in power. So I think they're very good at putting money on both red and black. So depending on, you know, at the casino, whoever wins, they seem to place bets on that. Because I think in many ways, they're agnostic about African politics. They're not ideologically committed to it. So if one party wins, if the ANC is out and the, the DA wins... Okay, as long as they maintain some continuity in trade investment and don't all of a sudden start inviting the Dalai Lama to come and speak, they're going to be okay. You know, you see this in uh, in the Congo, there was no change of power. The Chinese at the same time, though, were cultivating relationships with Moises Kutumbi, one of the opposition leaders, and you could see that they were building up this insurance policy in the event that Chesekedi was going to lose. What do you think, Giraud? And they're still waiting, and they're still waiting. The funny part that you mentioned about the DRC election, a very disputed election, I'd say it's still ongoing because the final results have still to be confirmed, and we are hearing rumors of many things happening in the country. And it's really interesting how, by this election, China is kind of still waiting. They did not congratulate Chisekedi on this election. We saw a lot of European countries have done that. We saw a socialist party in France, African countries have done that. But the US has said, you know, we still taking note, we're observing. China has done the same. It just tells you how much China is kind of now prudent in how, on how things are going to unfold. They're kind of waiting on how it's going to look like the final political environment in DRC to be able to move forward in that direction. And the reality is, and the, that's the comment I wanted to make about Kobus, uh, what, what, about, the, about the comment that Kobus made, we don't really have fundamentally anti-China politicians on the continent. We know we have those who use the anti-China rhetoric when they want to go to election, but once the election are won, we don't have fundamentally people that say we're against China, against China policies, against how China is moving and everything. So that's why I believe that China is kind of always, when it comes to election in Africa, is like, yeah, we're going to choose stability. We're gonna, whether the election has been fair or not, or transparent or not, but we're going to always side where there is sign of stability, where that's, you know, lines of stability is looking at. So that's why I think China is not really worried, per se, about how elections are going to happen you know, on the continent, because they don't face any 
anyone, even after the coups that we saw in, in West Africa, no one came out to be like anti-China, even Dumbuya in Guinea, where we're worried about how much is going to happen. Even Dumbuya himself became much more pro-China because of what they're doing in Simandu. So I don't think that China is really worried about those election process in the country at all. And if it was going to happen anywhere, it would have happened in the DRC over the contract issue and the unfair mining deals that were signed under the previous government. And even in Kenya last year, when William Ruto came to power, he ran on a slightly critical, I won't call it anti-China, but he was slightly critical of Chinese illegal immigrants. And he said, I'm going to evict Chinese illegal immigrants, which is a very safe way. And of course, he has not done that. And then he also said he was going to reveal the full terms of the standard gauge railway oh, yeah. contract, which he did not do <laughs> either. So, and that was the extent of his kind of criticism of the Chinese. We have not seen any politician like Michael Sada, who was the former Zambian opposition leader, who then became president and really defined anti-China politics in the early 2010s. And then as soon as he came to power, though, he switched Entirely. And in fact, he made his first overseas trip to China and he became one of China's biggest advocates on the continent. But in many ways, he was the last opposition leader to run on a really strident anti-China campaign. And that was 15 years ago. So we haven't seen that in a long time. Let's stay with the theme of elections and get a perspective from Emmanuel Matambo, who is the research director at the University of Johannesburg Center for Africa-China Studies. Uh, Like Lucas, he too thinks that elections are going to play a pivotal role in shaping China-Africa relations in 2024, but he focuses particular attention on the campaigns in South Africa, not surprisingly, but also the United States. In the year 2024, I see Africa-China relations being strengthened by at least two factors, and both of them have to do with elections. In the United States, where Joe Biden will seek to be re-elected as president, he would not want to be seen as soft, especially now that all indications are that Donald Trump might go on to compete in that particular election. So Joe Biden will not want to look as though he is soft on uh, contentious issues such as America's relationship with China. Now, what that will do is to grant China a golden opportunity, so to say, to present itself as a more level-headed power in global politics and global economics. And that would be a win in terms of China's perception and China's allure to the developing world with Africa in particular. Another issue, also an election, has to do with South Africa's crucial election this year, which also marks South Africa's 30 years as a democratic country. The African National Congress is dipped to be losing a lot of ground, a lot of support. But then in China, it finds a very reliable partner that will alleviate the African National Congress to circumvent some, so to say, some of the issues that are damaging to its potential of retaining a majority in parliament. One of those issues, obviously, is the energy crisis that has gripped South Africa for several years now. And China has shown proper intent to help to alleviate um, South Africa's energy crisis. If that is done to an appreciable degree, it will increase the electoral fortunes of the African National Congress. And that in turn, will also strengthen South Africa's uh, relationship with, uh, with, with with China. Other issues, in addition to the two elections, obviously, are issues such as the intersecting perspectives that Africa and China have in general in terms of their appraisal of what is happening in Gaza and obviously what is happening in the war between Russia and Ukraine as well. So commonalities between Africa and China will reinforce Africa-China relations going into 2024. So, Kobus, while we have been a little bit down on the Africa-China relationship for most of this show, Matambo comes in with a more optimistic view that the geopolitics, which are very contentious, and in many ways, the elections in the United States will ultimately benefit the Chinese in terms of how they're perceived in Africa. Uh, Talk to us a little bit about your take on Matambo's assessment of the geopolitics of the U.S.-China relationship and how it plays out on the continent. 
I agree with him. I think if there is a rightward turn in the US, and particularly if there's a Trump victory in the US, that I think just cements a kind of a dynamic we've already seen, which is, you know, China increasingly trying to position itself as kind of speaking for slash with the global south on particular issues, you know, in which in which the, the conflict in Gaza has become particularly prominent. But I think drifting away, a rightward drifting of the US would necessarily pull it away from Africa, you know, particularly. But I think partly one of the big issues there, one of the big dynamics is a kind of a second Trump presidency raises a lot of questions about what the U.S., is then you know kind of like in in that case if there is someone you you know kind of where there is very strong indications that that he actually supported an insurrectionist moment within the u.s if, if someone like that wins a second presidency then that it, it, it throws up a lot of questions about how the u.s is going to be running international law you know, like the, the, a bunch of different questions about like what the U.S. is going to be like in the world. I think it's 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 going to be an un, an unprecedented moment. If it happens, it'll be an unprecedented moment, particularly unprecedented at least since the end of the Cold War. In terms of in, ter- in terms of a shift of the U.S.'s position in the re- in the rest of the world, and then a, like a bunch of kind of like work that will have to be done in terms of to work out where the the U.S. is standing in relation to a whole host of issues, including Africa. And you know, so Africa will be very low on that agenda, and that. That will then create, I think, space for China to engage if it wants to. But more specifically, I think, you know, China and everyone else will have to kind of navigate to try and kind of find a new, their footing in what is then a, a, a radically disrupted kind of global international scene. And, and I think that will probably be the biggest challenge, I, I, I assume. Giro, Kobus and Matambo have been talking a lot about the U.S., elections and the situation with the U.S. And we've, and that's been a theme of, of our discussion in many respects, as it usually is. But nobody, interestingly, has talked about Europe and how the politics in Europe, too, could play into this in terms of how Africa-China relations evolve as well. Because what we're seeing in Europe and is... big elections coming up in Europe as well, like, like European Commission elections coming up. Precisely. And a lot of those elections in Europe are framed around immigration. And the immigrants that a lot of white Europeans don't like come from Africa and the Middle East. And there is a sense of fortress Europe, the walls going up. They want to keep Africans on their side of the Mediterranean. How do you think the dynamic between Europe and Africa and the right wing shift in Europe may actually play into these politics that Kobus and Matambo are talking about with the United States in terms of how Africa sees the world and particularly China? It's really interesting to talk about uh, right extremists in Europe when, for instance, in uh, I think you follow that, what's the Italian prime minister, the right wing ex- uh, prime minister in Italy reversed the policy on immigration now, wanting much more immigration coming in in different sectors of the economy because she realized that they need much more manpower in those sectors where they need immigration to fill those, to fill those gaps. So yes, I think there is uh, there are gonna be things to watch on, on on that front as well because it's really important to see the rise of how the right wing in Europe is kind of impacting how Africa is seeing Europe and how they compare to China and they compare to the U.S. So when you see Biden, when I see now Biden Trump coming back in the U.S. is like right wing, and you see the rise of right wing in Europe as well as African. My worries in all that is the fact that. We won't seize the opportunity because for me, right wing means that less interference from external powers into internal powers in Africa. For me, it's an opportunity for many African countries to really take the agenda to reshape how they're going to make things work. But most of the time, they don't take the opportunity. They don't take the opportunity to say, okay, this vacuum left by the right wing on the international stage, it's really an opportunity for us to move up our own agenda with different countries, being in Europe or being in Asia or being, being China. But they don't take that opportunity. And for me... Let me just see if I understand what you're saying here. It's because you're saying that the right-wing politicians tend to be more isolationist and less interventionist. Exactly. That this will give more room for African countries. Okay, yeah, that's interesting. 
Exactly. It really gives them that opportunity to like, okay, now we can really move our own agenda. We can really work on different countries to see how we can move our own agenda for own interest. But they don't do that. They just stay on the side, keep on complaining that, you know, uh, Trump is calling them, you know, a-hole countries and here and that. They don't really see that the fact that because the U.S. is disengaging itself in African policy when African politics, if Trump came back to power, it's really an opportunity for Africa to say, okay, now we are really have we have much more freedom to engage into Gaza situation, to, to give our comment on Ukraine, and to give our own agenda a place to say, okay, now we are moving to that direction. And I hope that this time, if Trump comes back and if the right wing keep on gaining ground in Europe, I hope that African country will see that as opportunity rather than a threat to them. And just in the spirit of accuracy, Giraud, Trump did not refer to African countries as a-hole countries. They were s-hole countries. Uh, yes, s-hole. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got to get our yes. holes correct here. Okay, exactly. So <laughs> let's get a perspective from Europe now. Tim Zayons is a lecturer in international relations at the University of Freiburg in Germany and a research fellow at the Center for International and Comparative Politics at Stellenbosch University in Cape Town. Plus, he's the author of a new book that came out last year on the political economy of China's infrastructure development in Africa. Tim is a great friend of the program. We interviewed him and some of his colleagues last year on some of the great research that they've done on railways. He's one of the leading China-Africa scholars in Europe, and we're thrilled to have his perspective. He thinks that Africa is going to have a front row seat to the great power competition that Cobus referenced between the U.S. and China. And it's going to be a really important trend to watch, even as countries across the continent move to diversify their diplomatic and trading relationships beyond the major powers. Let's take a listen to Tim Zayance's perspective for 2024. For me personally, it will be interesting to observe how the growing interests among an entire host of external actors affect the relations between China and African governments and societies. The fact that we've witnessed more reconciling diplomacy between the U.S. and China in recent months cannot really hide the fact that the African continent is one of the world regions in which we will see an intensification of geopolitical and also geoeconomic competition. But it's not only U.S.-China rivalry which, which crucially affects Chinese engagements on the African continent. We've recently experienced a significant uh, diversification of Africa's external relations with actors from the EU, India, the UAE, Japan and other places actually intensifying their ties with African states and economies. In some ways, there is now greater international competition and arguably also more choice for African states. I mean, the announcement made by the US government and the EU to invest into rail infrastructure and logistics along Angola's Lobito Corridor to secure access to Zambian and Congolese minerals it's somehow a prime example for geopolitical and in fact also geoeconomic development that will have implications for China-Africa uh, relations. And to me, it seems likely that, that this decision taken by Western governments will cause Beijing to reassess opportunities to invest along other African corridors, notably along East Africa's Northern Corridor, which includes obviously Kenya's standard gauge railway, but also the Tanzania-Zambia uh, railway that I think is, is is likely to be privatized probably even in 2024. So it would not be uh, actually surprising if we see decisions either on Kenya's uh, standard gauge railway or on the Tazara um, being made by Beijing. And, and, and related to this, actually, 2024 will also bring new Chinese public-private partnership investments uh, across Africa. We have seen, uh, for instance, again, Kenya's President Ruto already having announced that the Kenyan government is no longer interested in further loans, uh, which they wouldn't be actually able to take on anyways for extending that, that railway, but rather would rather like to see Chinese equity investment in a public-private partnership because of Kenya's uh, dire fiscal uh, situation. So I think in, again in 2024, we will see more public-private partnership investments being negotiated between Chinese firms and, and African governments. And, and to me, and that's perhaps as a last point, it will be interesting to see how the Ninth Forum on China-Africa uh, Cooperation frames the future of Africa-China relations, both discursively, but then also how it is backed up in, in material terms. We can certainly expect further pledges to diversify uh, China-Africa cooperation 
um, and pledges of uh, investments in agriculture, productive capacities, and also mineral value chains. And again, here China is in, in many ways now experiencing intensified competition in these sectors with US actors and European firms um, not getting tired in, 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 in stressing that they want to invest in the, in the structural transformation of African economy. So for me, 2024 personally will be interesting to see how China-Africa relations change against pretty dynamic geopolitical development. Tim did such a great job, Kobus, of summarizing the key themes of our discussion here. Your column, I mean, he touched on all of those. It's going to be a very dynamic year. Again, FOCAC being a key indication of which way this relationship is going, but also those value chains he talked about. We've talked about those in terms of the competition with the U.S. in the battery metal space. And then, of course, the great power competition writ large. So, Kobus, I think you and Tim are soulmates right now in terms of your outlook on this year. Yeah, absolutely. I think his point around more public-private partnerships will be very interesting to watch. Um, and, and I agree with him uh, that, there, that there is scope for more. So I, I was recently, I was watching um, an, an older uh, webinar from 2021 around the previous FOCAC recently. Um, and Tang Xiaoyang, who we, we've also interviewed, a big, big China-Africa expert um, in, in China, you know, made the point that one of, one of the big problems facing African countries at that stage in 2021 was that they haven't found a way of making themselves attractive as markets to Chinese investors. And it'll be interesting to track how that goes. You know, I think since then, there's been some Chinese companies that have really made a lot of money in Africa, and particularly by also leaning into African demand, and particularly African consumer demand. So, so um, Transian, the mobile phone company, is a, is a great example. So it'll be inter interesting to see whether there's, there's more interest in Chinese companies around African markets, and then also particularly whether there's interest in equity investment, you know, around long-term projects. The, the Leki port, the deep water port in, in Nigeria, is, is a, it w will be, a, a, I think, a crucial kind of example and it'll be very interesting to see whether more Chinese companies are interested in following a similar kind of route, which was a kind of an investment that, that also involved long-term operation. And, to just, you know, kind of, I, th I think if there are more Chinese companies that are interested in that, in that kind of option in Africa, I think 2024 would be an interesting year to, year to try it out. And I think that may well be good news for Africa as well. But overall, Chinese investment in Africa has plummeted. It went from 11% yes. of the total in, I think it was 2022. And then the last numbers we have, according to Ernst & Young, came from 2023, or maybe it was 21, 22. And then, uh, but it went from 11% to 2.9%. So that is not a good indication. And China also fell from being the number fourth largest foreign direct investor to number five. So the trend lines in terms of FDI are not going in the right direction. The question of public-private partnerships that Tim brings up, I think, requires a little bit of sobriety and some caution here, because you're seeing a lot of governments like Kenya, for example, putting forward ideas to say they want to bring Chinese investors in to extend the standard gauge railway to the Ugandan border, you know, under the guise of a public-private partnership, much the same way that they built the... Nairobi Expressway, which was a public-private partnership with the China Road and Bridge Corporation. The problem is, is the range of projects that can succeed under a PPP-type format tend to be limited to those that are generating lots of cash quickly. And so telecom networks do quite well. Some toll roads, as we're seeing in Nairobi, do quite well, but they have to be in very densely populated areas. And so you're not going to get the kind of public good infrastructure in a public-private partnership, for example, sewage systems or uh, these types of infrastructure that don't generate money right away. They're, again, they're public good infrastructure. So, Giraud, I think this question of PPPs is attractive. It sounds great, but the opportunities may be more limited simply because Chinese investors want to return on their capital. They don't want to just give money away and then say, you know what, it's a loan or it's it's aid. That's not how the Chinese play the game. 
No, it's not going to be happening you know, in those public service kind of projects. It's going to happen in projects where there is a financial and economic viability on the longer yeah, run. Yeah, power, for example. Electricity might be one area. Exactly. Even railway in a certain extent. That's why, for example, in the case of the Tazara, because Tom and Tim also mentioned that really they're really going thorough into validating and really approving the project to make sure that it's really ec- it economically makes sense. That for sure we're going to see that we're going to see a lot of that, but not the way and not where African countries are going to expect it in terms of public service. It's going really to be in those places where it's going to generate a lot of cash. Quick cash, I don't know, but a lot of cash and where they can, they can have a guarantee in terms of economic stability on how the project is going to run because a PPP also comes with many risks, you know, the risk of like economic instability, political instability, how you manage that and everything. We're going to see how China is going to be innovative in a way of negotiating new contract. I mean, for me, I'm expecting if China comes into that PPP space and if we see a lot of presence there, I mean, I'm expecting to see a lot of innovation in terms of contract negotiation and provision in those contracts that they're going to sign with, with African countries. And also keep an eye on the China-France relationship in Africa for these types of arrangements. The Chinese have done very innovative deals with the French. The Port of Lecky, which Cobus mentioned, is a Sino-French-Singaporean deal that was done with the Lagos government, as well as the East Africa Crude Oil Pipeline, that is a partnership among the Ugandan government, Sinuk, and Total. Controversial as it may be in Uganda, nonetheless, it does show that the Chinese and French at the corporate level oftentimes have a comfort working together. And so that's one area that I would... A pragmatic view. Very pragmatic view. And, and this happens, by the way, at multiple levels. So those are the two big examples of it. But one of the things that Giro and I have picked up over the years is how many Sino-French deals are being done in Africa. And they're very collaborative and pragmatic, as you've pointed out. Again, separated from the politics. Uh, Kobus, you talked about... The comments from Professor Tang Xiaoyang from Tsinghua University, again, who is probably one of the most well-known Chinese development scholars in China, and he talked about the need for markets. Now, the one exception to that is Nigeria. And Nigeria, because of its massive 200 million population, is able to create markets large enough to attract Chinese investment. And just this week, Kobus, you've been writing a lot about how there's been a series of really high-value industrial investments coming from the Chinese into Nigeria in precisely the sectors that Africans have said they want, which is industrial, uh, battery metal supply chains, energy. Uh, Talk to us a little bit about some of the past few weeks of deals in the China-Nigeria space that we've been watching. This is a tricky field to navigate because the Nigerian press, frequently a lot of things get announced and then there's a lot of complications around them. You know, some, right. so some of that's these... A good point. No, no, that's a very good point. We got to be wary of a lot of that. Particularly the battery metal kind of deal has a lot of questions around it. But they, there's there's been interesting deals where, for example, they, they did a, a, a deal between a Nigerian a natural gas company and a Chinese company to liquefy some of, some of the gas in order to avoid gas flares you know it's where the the, that kind of like iconic thing where they they have the kind of big kind of stack with a huge flame at the top you know where where excess gas is kind of burnt off it's terrible for the environment so they they're actually now turning that excess gas into liquefied gas and you know kind of which will then be sold on for example so a lot of these are, are are very encouraging i think and i think in lots of ways i think nigeria is you know i mean nigeria is obviously a very complicated country but like it is kind of struggling trying to kind of pull itself you know towards more industrialization, including, for example, steel making. So there's this, there's intensive negotiations um, between a Chinese company and and the Nigerian government around a possible steel plant in Nigeria. So it'll be interesting to see whether the Nigerian government can pull that off. You know, kind of con- considering how complicated it is domestically, and then whether the Chinese are able to make those kind of deals work. For me, in all of this, you know, kind of Africa, obviously, you know, as we said, this but Africa is both very big and very complicated. But there's also in the Africa-China relationship, a kind of a tendency towards mission creep, you know, kind of where there's just more and more things are added. And, you know, and and we, we, 
Yeah, and, and there's a strong demand from African from the African side to keep adding more things. Within that, what I would be really be, be looking for is some form of focus. And, and to to my mind, green energy is probably one of the is is, is, is a form of lower is a kind of low hanging fruit. I think they're relatively easy to monetize. You know, China has huge capacity. Africa has huge demand. You know, there's a lot there that kind of works together within this kind of larger landscape. It seems to be a, a, a field that offers a lot of relatively immediate kind of benefits on both sides so whether the Chinese and the Africans are able to identify those fields for cooperation for kind of pragmatic cooperation will be a a big litmus test for me I think. That gas liquefaction deal that you talked about which is both good for the environment because it captures a lot of that excess pollution that's going out into the air but also brings potentially a billion dollar investment now you are right that we should all be very cautious about the talk of these deals and the media coverage of these deals and what actually ends up happening that being said there is more buzz and more talk and discussion going on about china nigeria relations than anywhere else on the continent with the major exception of course of the drc and the mining space that's there but let's get a perspective our last perspective of the show today from toby ashodi who teaches political science at lagos state university toby he's been on our program a couple of times over the past couple of years we're actually going to have him back in about a month at the end of february to talk about his new research cobus on here you go, renewable energy partnerships between China and Africa. So he's in that space now. This also coincides with the launch of our upcoming interactive map that's tracing all of the Chinese energy and renewable energy projects across the continent. Now, Toby comes to us with a very Nigerian perspective, which is what we asked him for. And he said that Nigeria really stands out in Africa as a major destination for Chinese investment and trade. We've seen a lot of that in just the past few weeks, as as Kobus pointed out. But let's get Toby's assessment for what he sees in 2024 for China-Nigeria relations. Nigeria-China relationship has historically been cordial. And I don't think 2024 would be any different. For me, three interconnected issues, you know, are actually worth monetary. First, the current government is confronted by huge and difficult multidimensional economic challenges that would make any fundamental shift in Nigeria's relationship with China problematic and difficult at the current moment. So I foresee that ongoing Chinese infrastructure project would continue. Nigeria-China trade would also continue. Second, I see expansion in China's presence in the renewable energy sector in Nigeria. Not only are Chinese electric vehicles and electric motorcycles becoming popular in, in Nigeria, but of course, November last year, during the COP28, Nigeria signed an agreement, a 150 million agreement with um, Shenzhen Development Company to set up lithium battery manufacturing plant in Nigeria. So I look forward to how that uh, unfolds. Totally, the, the, you can see the visibility, and I see the visibility of Chinese uh, presence. Chinese projects continuing. Last year, the Blue Rail, for example, started moving about half a million people in Lagos. This year has been, it is expected that this year the Red Line will come on board and that is expected to move an estimated 1 million people on a daily basis. So you can, that you can see how, you know, the, the Chinese projects impacts people, for instance, in Lagos on a daily basis. Then the Transport University too in Casino State already started admitting students. So students this year would be studying, you know, at the Transport University, which is an interesting development, if you ask me. But as all these events unfold, I foresee non-state actors like the media, individual and civil society groups continuously challenging the vagueness in Chinese projects and agreements in Nigeria. Any talk of a new Chinese loan, for instance, I foresee it will be divisive and it will be challenged by these non-state actors more than the National Assembly. 
Which is so interesting, Kobus, because the loan situation in Nigeria with the Chinese is actually more in control than pretty much anywhere else on the continent. When you look at Nigeria, total loan portfolio is somewhere around $100 billion, and the Chinese account for about 3 to 4% of that. But yet, we've talked about this for years, that in the imagination of the Nigerian media and politicians, the Chinese loan issue figures much more prominently. I am so glad that Toby brought up the question of mobility. I think that's going to be a huge thing this year, that Chinese automotives and Chinese mobility technology in tricycles, motorbikes, or e-scooters are going to be a huge thing, and especially in South Africa, Cobus, where Cherry, for example, is now among the top five in the SUV market in Haval, and you're seeing so many Chinese electric vehicle car brands making inroads in South Africa, and even non-internal combustion cars are also making a major inroads as well. So great that Toby brought that up. But renewable energy, there you go. That's another theme. He seems to think that's also going to be a big player in South Africa. So let's get your thoughts on Toby's assessment and then kind of help bring us home now about the year and what you've heard. Yeah, I completely agree with Toby that I think both mobility, you know, in in terms of infrastructure, but also in terms of e-mobility, as well as renewable energy are going to be huge fields. And, you know, I think they will actually go together with this anxiety about debt and lending. You know, kind of, I think even though, you know, as you say, Nigeria doesn't particularly have a Chinese debt problem, and even though Nigeria is actually has, has quite high levels of transparency around debt, you know, there, there's still a lot of unanswered questions around debt in, in Nigeria and in the rest of Africa, particularly in Nigeria, particularly around Western held market rated lending. And all of this anxiety around big loans is going to affect the choices made by African policymakers and may well push them in the same kind of like small but beautiful kind of direction that the Chinese are heading in anyway. And in that context where no one wants to now be the person who kind of took on the huge new loan, small-scale e-mobility, small-scale renewable energy, microgrids, those kind of things all provide politicians the opportunities to cut ribbons and to have some kind of some something that they can show but something that isn't necessarily going to kind of saddle them with with a huge amount of debt that they then have to answer for so so i think in lots of ways it may well be aligning that that african and chinese you know kind of actors are are kind of on the same page in terms of where they might work together I think it's also a part of this small small mobility. It's also a part of Chinese soft power in Africa. We usually don't speak about it because when you talk about China and Africa, we see big stuff, we see big infrastructure. I think those small projects really bring China close to people when people can see, you know, I'm riding a scooter that made of China, that made of Chinese material coming from China or made here by a Chinese company. And it's really now give China much more closer power to people than that it was before. Before, you know, with big project, with big infrastructure. Now with that, people can see now those small projects, can see them, China close to them. That I think that's why China also is going to push forward in those spaces. And that's why at the end, Xi Jinping called it smart and beautiful in a certain way, because it's also smart. It's also contribute to China, soft power and image in Africa. And especially when it touches to the youth, you know, when those small products, usually it's, it touches to young people and also, yeah, it's going to have a huge impact in terms of Chinese visibility and, and how people perceive China in Africa. Okay. Wow. I think if uh, anybody's still with us listening to this, they will have their heads spinning with all the different things <laughs> that need to follow along for the year ahead in Africa-China relations. It is going to be a very eventful year. This is not going to be business as usual as it has been for the past few years in many respects in terms of the stability of the China-Africa relation in the post-pandemic era. Lots is in play. There's just no doubt about it. I hope that the perspectives from Asia, Africa, the United States, and Europe were useful to help you better understand which direction everything is going. That's, of course, the work that we do here. That's what we're trying to do every day, what Giro and Cobus and the rest of the team are trying to provide these insights for you, the listener and the follower of these issues, to be able to have smarter insights on it and to navigate what's going on. And to kind of pick up on what Giro was saying, that for a lot of people, and this is something that is a problem in Africa, the United States, Europe, is having a China vision and a China strategy. And this question of China literacy is so important, is that you got to figure out what's going on. And it's a very poorly understood subject. And that's the space that we're trying to fill. If you would like to hear more about this on a daily basis and dive into our archives 
and better understand what's going on, try out a subscription to the China Global South project this year. Go to chinaglobalsouth.com slash subscribe. We give you a free 30-day trial so you can try it out. You get the newsletter every day. You can use our AI chatbot that we've got, which is a closed network chatbot that provides what we feel is a far more balanced view than what you get on the open ChatGPT or BARD. And uh, also you get transcripts of the podcast and so much more. So once again, chinaglobalsouth.com slash subscribe. For our student and teacher subscriptions, we have a 50% discount. So send me an email, eric at chinaglobalsouth.com, and I'll send you the links for that half-off discount. So gentlemen, thank you very much for your time today. I also want to thank all of our contributors and all of those who I reached out to. A lot of folks said the year's off to a busy start and they couldn't submit, but they do want to participate. So we'll have them, a lot of those folks on the show this year. We have about 50 shows scheduled for 2024 on China, Africa. We're going to continue our 15th year. We're getting close to 900 episodes, if you can believe that on this show. (laughs) Gobis, it makes me feel old when we say that. But it has been a wonderful journey. And also, we're going to resume our China Global South podcast in the next week or two as well after a short break for the winter holidays. So for Giro Nima in Mauritius, for Kobus van Staden in Johannesburg, I'm Eric Olander. Thank you all for taking the time to listen. And we wish you all a very prosperous 2024. The discussion continues online. Tag us on Twitter at China GS Project and visit us at chinaglobalsouth.com. If you speak French, check out our full coverage at projetafriquechine.com and Afriquechine on Twitter. That's Afrique with a K. And you'll also find links to our sites and social media channels in Arabic.